Say, there's nothing like being with God's people in God's presence. Amen. My name is Andrew Carroll, and I'm one of the pastors here at New Life Community Church. Pastor Steve and Pastor Tammy are away this morning, so I have the wonderful privilege of opening God's Word up with you today. How many of you were here last week? Last week was such an incredible Sunday as we launched the new series that we as New Life are going through this summer. It's a series on the life of David from shepherd to king. And last week, Pastor Steve launched the series off when he talked about David being anointed. But this morning, we're going to continue in the life of David. And we're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 14 through 23. So if you have your Bibles this morning, would you open up with me to 1 Samuel chapter 16. And we're going to look at verses 14 through 23. And as you're turning uh, your Bibles to that passage, I want to ask you, how many of you had a great 4th of July this past week? Did you enjoy it? Yes. What, did, uh, what a great day. Did any of you travel out of the city to go celebrate somewhere? How many of you stayed within the city? Oh, that's great. This week, I had the opportunity to, my, my brother who lives in Alaska came to town and together we drove up to Sacramento. Sacramento is where I was uh, born and we had a chance to spend this week with family and 4th of July was amazing. It was great family, great food and plenty of illegal fireworks. <laughs> yeah, I was sitting there, my cousin was lighting them off. I'm like, that's not legal, but that is awesome. I was loving it. It was so good, so good. And I, I got to stay at one of my aunt's house. And I remember it was, it was Thursday, July 5th. And I, I go to breakfast. And there in my aunt's living room, there was this little table. And on the table was this photo album. And I love going to my aunt's house because she has all of the photos of our family for years past. So I grabbed this photo album and I put it on the table. So as I was drinking a cup of coffee, I was looking through and flipping the pages and seeing some pictures. And, and I wanted to know, would it be okay if I share some pictures with you? Can I, was that all right? All right, I want to begin by showing you a picture of my grandma. I love my grandma. This is Grandma Jean, right? Now, Grandma Jean was 100 years old just a few months shy of 101 before she went to be with the Lord. So she was born in 1914, and then she went to be with the Lord in 2014. And I, 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 I was so fortunate to grow up in the same city that, that my grandmother lived at. I, I went to the same church. Um, after church, we go over to grandma's house, and I love grandma. And grandma, grandma knew Jesus. You know what I'm talking about? Like, she knew Jesus and she trusted in the Lord almost to a fault. Like, like grandma, you got a plan, right? <laughs> you got a plan. No, she, she just trusted the Lord in everything that she did. So I, I was looking at these photo albums and I found some pictures of my grandma that I had never seen. In fact, this next one is the earliest picture that I've ever seen of my grandmother. She's the one there on your left. And my grandmother when she was uh, in her early childhood, she moved from Kansas to Colorado on a horse and buggy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and grandma, grandma was feisty. Grandma had a, you know, being the oldest daughter of a large, uh, you know, of many siblings, she didn't really have much of a childhood because growing up, she had to learn cooking and cleaning and taking care of. So she that, that was grandma. Grandma was a hard worker and that carried on to her teenage years. In fact, here's a picture of my grandmother when she was a teenager. And uh, my grandmother married my grandfather when she was 19 years old. She was a kid. But I guess in those days, kids married kids. I don't, I don't know. But, but I remember talking with my grandmother and she said, my, my grandfather was um, the son of a preacher man. In Lindsay, California, there was an old Assemblies of God church that my great-grandparents led, and my grandfather was their son. And, and my grandma told me that grandpa would date around. But when she dated grandma, grandma put a stop to that, right? <laughs> there was this feistiness in her. In fact, my aunts were telling us a story that I had never heard before, that when my grandmother and grandfather first got married, my grandpa would leave his clothes out on the floor, right? Men, married men, how many of you leave your clothes out on the floor? All right, some of y'all lying in church, right? Where are all the wives at? 
Do your husbands leave? Okay, I, there are times when I walk in and I miss the hamper and it just kind of ends up. So that was true of my grandfather. So do you want to know what my grandma did? Literally, my grandma took a hammer and a nail and nailed his clothes down to the floor. All right? My aunt told us this. My wife started laughing, and then I looked at her. I said, please don't get any ideas, right? All right? But, but grandpa was, uh, grandma was feisty, and here's a picture of my grandfather. My grandfather, uh, one thing that my grandpa learned to do is he learned to fly planes. So throughout his life in Lindsay, they, they ran this, you know, um, orn, like this, this farm, and he worked for a company, but he, he would fly planes. And so there were different times in my mother's childhood where they would get in their four-person plane and they would go, you know, different places. But, you know, when you live 100 years, 100, you, you see a lot of transitions in your life, right? Like, think about it. Grandma moved from Kansas to Colorado, horse and buggy. Now at her 99th and 100th birthday, she's FaceTiming with family on the other side of the country. Like, Grandma has seen a lot of transitions. But when I was talking with my aunts, there was one particular transition that was difficult, that, that, that stood apart from the rest. And the story goes that it was my grandmother and my, uh, my grandma and grandpa, my mom and my cousin Jerry, and they were going to go from California to Anchorage, Alaska, because in Alaska they were going to catch a uh, like a cruise ship and, and, and go. So, so they get in their four-person plane and they fly from California to Anchorage. They get to Anchorage and everything's going well. And then they check in at the hotel. And that night, my grandmother went to sleep with her husband beside her. But in the middle of the night, my grandfather had a sudden heart attack, went to be with the Lord. And on this day, July 8th, in 1969, 49 years to this date, my grandma woke up and my grandpa, my grandpa was no longer there. He was with the Lord. And that transition out of all the things that my grandma had experienced was probably one of the most difficult, one of the most heartbreaking things. But you know what got her through it? It wasn't self-help. It was God's help right? How many of you know when we go through transitions in our lives, we have choices that we need to make. Some people choose to self-destruct. So when everything's moving on in their life and, there, and there's pieces and there's situations that are out of their control, a lot of times people's response is they choose self-destruction and they, they participate in habits that are harmful to themselves and they just go deeper into it. Other people, rather than running to God's word, they run to Google, or they run to Barnes and Noble, they get any book that will help them, self-help them move from where they are to where they wanna be. But when you go through the difficult transitions of your life, you don't need self-help, you need God's help. But he, he, here's what I see. You can't trust God if you don't know him. I mean, there are so many people in our society and in my life, and I would say the same might be true for you, people that you know, that their life is turning upside down. And you're thinking to yourself, why are you running to God? Why isn't he your strong tower, your fortress? But to be honest with you, most people aren't running to God because they don't know God. They're not trusting God because you can't trust someone you don't know. But my grandma, she trusted the Lord. In fact, as we were going through pictures, we found my, my grandma did poetry. And we found a poem that my grandma shared at my grandfather's funeral, and I wanted to share it with you today. This is what she wrote. She said that life is a book in volume three, the past, the present, and the yet to be. The past is finished and laid away. The present we are living from day to day. The third and last of volume three is locked from sight. God keepeth the key. This morning, we're going to talk about transitions in our lives. But more specifically, how do you and I, how do we trust God in the transitions of our lives? And what I want to do is I want to give you three reasons why you can trust God in the transitions you're going through. Three reasons that describe who he is. Because this is what I believe, that you can't trust somebody you don't know. So here's my prayer for you today. My prayer is, I know that there are people in this room that right now you are going through transitions in your life. There are situations that are changing and moving and you don't know what the future is going to look like 
What you need right now is not self-help, but you need God's help. And my prayer is that as we read this passage and this story, that your eyes would be open, that you would get a glimpse of who God is, of how good he is, and that knowing him, you'd begin to trust him right in the middle of the transition that you're in. Amen? So with our Bibles open, let's read our passage. 1 Samuel chapter 16, we're going to look at verses 14 through 23. Picking up from where Pastor Steve left off last week. Verse 14, now the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Saul's attendant said to him, see, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the lyre. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes on you, and you will feel better. So Saul said to his attendants, find someone who plays well and bring them to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem. Who knows how to play the lyre? He's a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well, and he's a fine-looking man, and the Lord is with him. And then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat, and sent them with his son David to Saul. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armor bearers. Then Saul sent word to Jesse, saying, Allow David to remain in my service, for I am pleased with him. Whenever the Spirit from God came on Saul, David would take up his lyre and play. Then relief would come to Saul, he would feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. In this story, you and I are going to discover three things, three reasons why you and I can trust God in the transitions of our lives. So if you're taking notes, I want to encourage you to write this down so that later you can go back and study the passage on your own. But the first thing we see, number one, is that God is powerful. Would you say that with me? God is powerful. Do you believe that in your life? That God is powerful. And where do we see this? We see this in the opening part. Let's look at verses 13 and verses 14 and and see how this passage unfolds. In verse 13, it says, So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, referring to David, in the presence of his brothers. And from that day, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. Verse 14, Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. So what do we see here? Okay. Why has this story been passed down from generation to generation throughout the centuries? It's a story of transition. It's a story of how Saul transitioned out of being king and David transitioned into the role of being king for the people of Israel. And so what we see here is this transfer, this, this uh, exchange. On one hand, David is being anointed king. So what happens? The Spirit of God has come upon him. As a result of the Spirit of God coming upon David, the Spirit of the Lord has departed from Saul. Do you you guys see the change, right? So David is now called and anointed to be king. So the Spirit of God is upon him, resulting in that Spirit upon uh, Saul being left. And guess what? And an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Now, when I read this, I had questions. I was like, Lord, help me understand here, like, Like, God is sending an evil spirit, right? So when people say, like, I'm filled with the spirit. (laughs) Like, what are we talking about here? Like, which one are you you filled with, right? So, but then I realized, you know, this actually begins to make sense. You know, and I think of every parent who's ever had a conversation with their child to let them know that they're having a younger brother come into the family, right? Sent from the Lord to torment them. How many younger siblings in the house? Listen, I am the youngest. This was my calling. This was my role. This was my role in life to to torment my older brothers, right? But what do we see happening in scripture here? Think about it. Saul was chosen to be king, but as a result of the Holy Spirit, God's presence has now left him Samuel the prophet is not speaking to him. So rather than moving in faith, he is overcome by fear, right? Rather than moving in confidence, he's terrified. 
Because he no longer feels the presence of God with him and he's no longer listening to the prophet of God to obey the word of the Lord. Now, why did this happen, okay? Number one, God is powerful. But let's, let's kind of uh, step into this for a moment. If you want to understand what's happening here in the life of Saul and David, in fact, if you want to understand what's happening throughout the storyline of Scripture, you have got to understand football. How many football fans in the room? Come on. Amen. I'm telling you, this is so true. If you want to understand the Bible, you have got to understand football. And I hope that this clip will help make sense for you. Go ahead and watch this clip. If the Cardinals can hold at the point of attack, Matthews over the top, fumble the ball. And recovered by the Cardinals, Rashad Johnson. And he pitches into the ball's loose, and the Chargers get a touchdown. It was, you can see the ball come out. I don't know who got it. Calais it Campbell it poked was it free. Well, watch here what happens when Rashad Johnson, I don't know what he was thinking, and that Acho couldn't handle it, but Dan Williams got hurt. Amazing, right? The Chargers had the ball. Their goal was to get the ball into the end zone. And what, what did they do? They fumbled it, right? Then the Cardinals recovered. But guess what? The Cardinals fumbled it, and the Chargers got it, and they ran it in. That is a picture of the Bible, my friends. <laughs> so true. I'm telling this is so true. Why? Well, let's go back. Let's go back to the beginning. In the beginning, God created a good creator, created a good world, and he had a good plan for it. And he planted Adam and Eve in the garden. And as humanity, he gave humanity un a unique role, that they were to be his image bearers. Now, what in the world does that mean? It was this two-way mirror that they would, number one, take the praises of creation and reflect them to the Lord in worship to glorify God. But then number two, that they would rule the earth, that they would shape this direction in a way that reflected God's character, right? God, from the very beginning, has chosen to work his purposes in the world through humanity. And God's purpose has have always been for the whole of his creation. So what does God do? When he created the world, he didn't create it perfect. He created it good. It was loaded with potential and possibility. It was going somewhere. So he takes his purposes and he entrusts them to Adam and Eve, right? Like football, right? Amazing game. Millions of people watch it every week. But it all comes down to one thing. Men on a field, and there is one ball, and the whole purpose of it is to take this one ball and to move it forward, right? People spend their lives to do one thing, to move this ball forward. In the same way, humanity's goal, their task, their commission, was to take the purposes of God and move it forward. Did not get far, right? Why? Because in chapter 3, they got hit. They got hit by the snake in the garden. And when they got hit by the snake in the garden, they fumbled it. Adam and Eve, butterfingers, right? Rather than listening to their creator, they listened to creation. Rather than trusting God's definition of what was good and evil, they decided to choose for themselves. And so they fumbled it. They fumbled it. And we see this spiral out from Genesis 3 to Genesis 11 with Cain and Abel, Noah and the flood climaxing in chapter 11 with the Tower of Babel when all of the nations of the earth were standing in rebellion against God because they were going to become like God on their own, not, not listening to God's command to fill the earth. So what does God do in Genesis chapter 12 with this creation that he loves, but this creation that's in rebellion against him? What does he do? He chooses one man. And he says, I'm going to bless you. Now listen why. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. I'm going to bless you so that through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So once again, the, the purposes of God have been entrusted to Abram. And their goal was to move it forward, to move God's saving purposes forward. But let's be honest. Abraham made some mistakes. You guys remember Genesis 16? where uh, Sarah came up with a great idea. Why don't you sleep with my slave and we'll create, you know, God's promise on our own. That did not go well. And by the way, might I say, anytime your wife says, here's a great idea, go sleep with somebody else. Not a good plan, my friends, not a good plan. So he has some trouble, but listen, even when we fumble it, God is faithful. Do you believe that? 
even when we fumble it, God is faithful. And so God was faithful to his promise, Isaac, and then through that, that the people of Israel as a group came to be. And now we move to the story in the book of Exodus. And what do we see happening in Exodus? Well, the people of God are now moved out of Egypt and into the promised land. And in Exodus 34, God tells the people of Israel, he says, listen, I am choosing you as a holy nation set apart to be a kingdom of priests to the nations. Why? It's the same promise as in Genesis 12, which is the same promise as in Genesis uh, 1 and 2, that God wanted to bless Israel so that through Israel, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So Israel was supposed to be a reflection of the Lord. So Israel gets the ball. What are they called to do? They're called to move the purposes of God forward. But what do we know happens? Israel fumbles it. Because rather than trusting the Lord, they rebel against the Lord. So what happens? So Jesus comes down to do what you and I could not do. He came down to be Israel to Israel. He came down to show you and I what it means to be truly human. Think about this. Humanity was created in the image of God, but we blew that, right? We took the ship and we just crashed it. So Jesus Christ, the image of God, comes down to do what you and I could not do, to make a way to God, right? All throughout the Bible, we see two things. Number one, every time we fumble it, God is still faithful. Why is that? Because although we're bearers of the promise, we're also carriers of the problem. Every single one of us in this room, we have butterfingers. It's true. And we see this not only in the storyline of the Bible, but we see it in Saul. So let's talk about Saul real quick. In 1 Samuel... This, uh, the Israels were, were led by judges, but Israel was like, I don't want to have Yahweh be king. We want to be like all the other nations and have a king of our own. But Israel was never called to be like the other nations. They were called to be a reflection of the Lord. But the Lord in his goodness allowed Israel to make their choice, even if that choice was rejecting him. So what did God do? God chose Saul. God equipped him. God put his spirit on him. He gave the ball to Saul. Saul had the ball. Now, what was his goal? To move the purposes of God forward. How? By reflecting God's heart as he led the people. But what happened to Saul? He fumbled it. How did he fumble it? Why? He rejected the word of the Lord. And when he was confronted with it, rather than repenting, he tried to manipulate God by offering a half hearted sacrifice. And that's where it says in scripture that rebellion is as of the sin of witchcraft. Why? Because witchcraft is where you manipulate the forces to carry out your will. Saul was trying to manipulate God to get what he wanted rather than obeying the Lord. So Saul fumbled it. So what do we see in our passage right now? Now the purposes of God have been entrusted with David. And David has been anointed king. That's what Pastor Steve talked about last week. And now we see him moving toward his calling. But over and over again, we see this, that God is powerful. That every time you and I fumble, he is still faithful. Can I be honest with you? There are times in our lives where we drop the ball. There are times in our marriages where we drop the ball. There are times in the raising of our children that we drop the ball. But I praise God that even when I fumble it, that God is faithful. I praise God that my mistakes don't change God's faithfulness. That even in my unfaithfulness, God is still faithful to his word. Do you believe that today? Yeah. Amen. But not only do we see God being powerful, there's a second thing we see in this passage. Not only is God powerful, but secondly, God is purposeful. God is purposeful. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that God has a purpose. And we see this as we look at verses 15 through 18. In verse 15, it says, Saul's attendant said to him, see an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the liar. He will play when the evil spirit of God comes on you and you will feel better. So he said to his attendants, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the liar. He's a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and he's a fine looking man. And most importantly, it says, and the Lord was with him. 
Secondly, we see that God is purposeful. Here's what's interesting. When God chose to remove the, the, the spirit on Saul and, and place it on David, what did that do? That created a need. It created a need that Saul needed somebody to come in who knew how to play the lyre. That when they would play, he would, rather than being filled with fear, he would calm down. And guess what, my friends? There just happened to be a young shepherd boy who played a liar. Here's what I want to tell you today. All you and I need to be is exactly who God created us to be. All you and I need to be is exactly who God has created us to be. Listen to this. Your gift mix, your personality, your experiences your temperament, all the things that make you you. What that is, is that is a unique variation of the breath of God that has been breathed into your life in order to reflect his goodness into the world. We need you to be you. Can I tell you something? We live in a world where there's too many echoes and not enough original voices. We live in a society where everybody is singing a cover song, but no one's writing original music. And we see this in the way that we relate to people, right? Because what we do is number one, we wonder. We wonder, am I good enough? We wonder, have, have you know, uh, and we struggle with insecurity and we say to ourselves, I wish I was more like so-and-so. And we can always test the motives of our heart when there's somebody who's in the same season of life and the Lord blesses them. And we have an opportunity to either A, be critical of why did God bless you and not me? Or B, we can step into it as an invitation to celebrate with them, right? I mean, take, take the family who's, who's been praying for children and they have friends that have been praying for children, but the Lord answers the, the prayer requests of one, but not the other. And there's this temptation to be like, why isn't this happening for me? Why can't I be more like so-and-so? Listen, all you need to be is exactly who God has created. We need you to be you. That's exactly who we need you to be. So not only do we see the purposes of God in David's life, but as we step back and what you'll notice as we work through the stories of David's life, that there's a purpose that carries through David's life. Because one of the questions we have to ask ourselves as it relates to God's will is what do we do with all the waste in our lives? How many of you have ever made a mistake? Okay, raise your hand, right? If your neighbor's hands not up, raise their hand, right? We've all made mistakes. There are skeletons in our closet. There are things that you and I have done that we are not proud of. So what do we do with the waste, right? I, I, I think of the person who for years had a drug addiction, but recently came to faith in Christ and realized that they missed the first 18 years of their son's life. But now they're in a different place than where they were. And so one of the questions is, man, 18 years, what, what do I do with that? Or what do you tell the woman who's been married 25 or 30 years only to find out that her husband's having an affair? 25, 30 years, all of the moments, all of the memories, everything that they've poured into it and what to show for it. Or how about the person who has studied to learn a particular skill? They've invested time and money and effort, but because of technology in the job market, what they have specialized in is no longer needed in this market. And they say to themselves, man, what do I... What do I do with, with the last 30 years of my life that I've been pouring into this, this craft? You know, there's a recycling plant, and uh, here's a video of it. It's one of the largest recycling plants in the world. And what they do is they take all the broken pieces, all of the trash, all the, the things that you and I throw away, and they receive it in. And rather than just tossing it away, they sort through it and they use every piece and they recycle it. It goes through a process by which that which was useless now becomes useful. Can I tell you, my friends, that this is what the Lord does with our lives. This is what the Lord does with our lives. Listen, God does not regret your past. And, I, and I'll say God doesn't even recycle your past. Here's what God does. God redeems your past. Do you believe that? You believe that? I believe that. Because think about that, right? It, if I was God and I had the ability to do whatever I wanted, I would go back and change things so I didn't make the stupid mistakes that I made, right? I'm like, man, how many of you ever thought that? I wish I could go back and do things differently. But we can't. But God doesn't edit our lives. What he does is he works 
out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. God is a God of purpose. He has a purpose in your life and he has a purpose through your life. And I, can I say this? Not only do we see that in the life of David, but look at the servants. Isn't it interesting that just at this right time, when Saul was looking for someone who played the liar, that there was a servant there. We don't even know his name. But somebody said, oh, Jesse has a son. Can I tell you this? God has a plan for your life. Do you believe that? But listen to this. The purposes of God do not revolve around God's plan for your life, but rather God's plan for your life revolves and contributes it to the larger purposes of God. Amen. Let me say it like this. You're going to love it. You're going to write this down, right? Turn to your neighbor and say, you're going to want to write this down, right? Yes. I'm going to tell you something. It's going to be helpful, super helpful. Are you ready? Yes. Here it is. Ready? It's not about you. <laughs> it's not about you, right? We don't, we don't even know that servant's name. But because he was there at the right place at the right time, God used him. And he was a part of the story of David coming into his calling. So not only is God powerful and not only is God purposeful, but there's the third thing. That God is present. That God is present. And we see this as we look through verses 18 through 23. The last phrase in verse 18, it says, the Lord was with him. And then Saul sent messengers to Jesse, and he said, send me your son David, who is with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat, and he sent them with his son to Saul, his son David to Saul. Verse 21, David came to Saul, and he entered his service. Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armor bearers. And then Saul sent word to Jesse, saying, allow David to remain in my service, for I am pleased with him. Whenever the Spirit from God came on Saul... David would take up his lyre and play. Then relief would come to Saul and he would feel better and the evil spirit would leave him. There's two things I, I want you to notice about those verses. Number one, the Lord was with David. The Lord was with him. And it reminds me of the story in the Bible where Joseph, it was described that the Lord was with Joseph. How, how many of you remember the story of Joseph? right? He was the, the youngest and he had all the older brothers. His older brothers hated him. So they threw him in a pit. And then they said, well, we have a better idea. Rather than throwing him into a pit, we can sell him as a slave and to make money. So they put him into slavery. Then he, then he moved from slavery to prison, right? Life's just getting better and better. But one thing, when you read Joseph's story, the thing that you notice all throughout is that the Lord was with him. And then secondly, in every situation, Joseph did the right thing, even in the wrong situation. And that's exactly what's happening in the life of David. The Lord is with David, but listen to this. David is doing the right thing, even in the wrong situation. Think about this. What Pastor Steve talked about last week, when David was anointed king. So David's anointed king, and where did he go? He went back to the sheep. But then in this story, we see that the, the transition begins to take place. So, so David is now brought to the palace. But is David king at this point? No. Who's king? Saul, right? And is Saul a reflection of Yahweh to his people? No. Is Saul leading the people of Israel in ways that honor the Lord? No. Should Saul be king? No. But what does David do? His first step toward his calling is to serve the current king in a way that brings value to him. Even though he's not in the best situation, even though he might be in the wrong situation, David is still doing the right thing. Why? Because the Lord is with him. And can I tell you today, you might be in a situation and it may not be the best situation and it may not be a perfect situation. In fact, it may be a bad situation or the wrong situation, but you are called to do the right thing even in the wrong situation. Why? Because God is present with you. Because God's here, I gotta... I can't compromise my integrity. I, I, I can't leave my convictions to the side. God is with me in this. So even though the situation's not right, I'm gonna do the right thing. That's exactly what David did. Notice this, that David was a fighter. He was a warrior, but he never had to fight for his position because he always did the right thing, even in the wrong situation, because God was with him. Here's a quote I wanna share with you. 
I love it. It says that there will come a time for all of us when we have to make a choice. And what's the choice? The choice is between what's right and what's easy. It's hard sometimes. But can I tell you, God did not call us to walk the easy path. God did not call us to do what's easy. It's easy to respond in anger. It's easy to respond in hate. It's easy to harbor bitterness, to speak bad about somebody. But God does not call you and I to walk the easy path. He calls us to be like him. So we must make the right choice even in the wrong situation. Why? Because God is with us. Ladies and gentlemen, God is powerful over the circumstances in your life. God has a purpose that runs through the circumstances of your life. And God is present right in the middle of your circumstance. That's who he is. Now here's my question to you. Now that you know him, will you trust him? You can't trust God with anything you haven't surrendered to him. There comes a moment when we have to take our cares and our concerns and the things in our lives and we take them out of our hands. And what do we say? We say, here, here. That's the prayer, that's it, it's one word. Here, God, here. God, my, my kids are not serving you. God, I raised them, but now they're making choices that are harmful and destructive and I, I have no control. They're not in the house and they're, they're gone. What do I do with that? Here. Here it is, God. God, I've been working at a job for years. And I just got the notice that I'm not going to be working there next up. I, I don't know what to do. I don't have provision. What do you do with that? Simple, here. Here it is. There was a young man by the name of William Borden who knew this. He knew how to trust the Lord. He grew up in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. And he, his family owned the Borden Dairy Factory, which was this multi-billion dollar business. So listen to this. In 1904, William graduated high school in Chicago. And do you know what his present was? I mean, at 16, he was already a millionaire. But here's what's his present. His parents sent him around the world to sell the world so he could see it. That was his graduation gift. But as he was selling the world, he began to see the broken people of the world. And God began to get a hold of his heart. And it was during that trip that he realized, he said, I'm gonna make a decision to live my life sharing with a dying world the good news of Jesus' love. So when he came back and he told his friends and his family, he said, I, I wanna be a missionary. Well, that wasn't their expectation. Their expectation was that he would continue with the family business. I mean, he was a multimillionaire at 16 years old. He had potential and possibility, but he said, no, 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 no. This is what God's called me to. And then he took his Bible and he wrote two words in his Bible, no reserves. Rather than trusting in his wealth, he trusted in the Lord and he put no reserves. Well, after high school, he went to graduate school. He went to Yale. And not only did he graduate from Yale, but then he did his seminary work at Princeton University. Brilliant man, full of potential. But by the time that he graduated graduate school, he had still believed his commitment earlier to follow the Lord. And at that point, his father wanted him to move into the family business. And the story goes that the father disowned him because of his decision to go into the mission field. But at that time in his life, William grabbed his Bible, he opened it up, and he wrote two more words. No retreat. No reserves, no retreat. The Lord had put on his heart that he, he wanted to go to China and he, he wanted to specifically reach the Muslim community with a message of Jesus' love. So as he sailed, he stopped in Egypt so that he could learn Arabic to help him in his studies. When he arrived in Egypt, he contracted spinal meningitis and with one month at the age of 25, William passed away. And when the news of his death hit the States, People said, oh, what a waste, what a waste. He had it all, but he left it and look where it got him. But then later they found William's Bible 
And they open it up and they realize that he had wrote a third phrase. And that third one was no regrets. No reserve, no retreat, and no regrets. Can I tell you this? William lived more life in those 25 years than most people live in 90 years because he lived a, he lived a life of trusting the Lord. And why did he trust him? Because he knew him. Can I tell you today? You can trust the Lord. I don't know what burden you've walked in with. I don't know what you're carrying. I don't know what's in your hands, but although it might be too big for your hands, it's not too big for his. Why? Because he's a God who's powerful. He's a God who has a purpose and he's a God present with you right here, right now. Would you stand with me today? This is how I wanna close the service. I wanna lead us in prayer and I'm gonna invite you to take your hands, put them in front of you, and close your eyes and just in your mind's eye, what is it in your life that you are struggling trusting the Lord with? Is it a relationship? Is it a financial situation? Is it a health issue? We all have cares, we all have concerns, we all have worries. But here's what I know to be true. If it's in your hands, it's not in His. And you can't trust God with anything that you haven't surrendered to him. So right now, I'm gonna lead us in prayer. I'm gonna pray for us. And I want you in your heart of hearts to take those worries and those concerns. And I want you to place them into the hands of your loving heavenly father. And in doing so, say, Father, I I, I trust you. And then after I, I pray, what we're gonna do is we're gonna sing a song. And this song is a declaration of faith. That even in the waiting, I'm going to believe the report of the Lord. That even in the waiting, that I'm going to trust in him. That God is not a man that he should lie, but his word never returns void. And then after that song, if you want prayer, our prayer teams will be open for you. But with your hands open, let's pray together. Father, I pray for every one of us in this room. You know our heart's concerns. You know our anxieties. You know the things that we've walked in with. But Father, right now, We declare, God, that you are good. You are a God who's powerful. You are a God who has a purpose. And you are a God who's present with us right here, right now. And so because we know you, we trust you. And we take those things out of our hands and our lives. And Lord, we place them into yours. We cast our cares upon you because we know you care for us. Thank you for being with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord by faith. Amen.